Right. Well, I mean, first of all, welcome to the Agit Props workshop. Um, as you can see behind me, this is the first time I've ever done a live feed from the workshop where the props are built. So I'm, I'm quite pleased with that. So my name's Paul. I'm primarily a, a cartoonist under the name of Polyp, um, but I also build props for campaign groups. I've done loads of them over the years, sort of, sometimes for groups that I volunteer with, mostly uh, these days as a, as a paid job, people like Friends of the Earth and so on and so forth. Uh, and I'm always really interested in, in, in being in at the concept stage of anything that I do or don't build. Um, so, yeah, that's basically my, my background. Um, the props are kind of like large cartoons. They're, they're all part of the whole thing of, of using visuals to communicate political and protest ideas. So that's my um, that's my background. Um, as I say, I've done uh, I've done quite a few workshops like this, and I, I've I've often introduced them as as the hunt for factor X. I think any kind of street event or prop or protest you do, there's always this factor X that everybody's looking for uh, in terms of what will either get media attention or get attention from the public, um, and that's really partly what I wanted to go through today. Is like some hints as to what does or doesn't work and the different sort of uh, issues that, that arise depending on the nature of the event and a little bit of a look as well at, um, at, at different sort of construction methods and what's easy and what's difficult and so on and so forth. So um, the first thing I wanted to sort of raise was um, was when you're considering doing a, a prop you need to think about is this a photo shoot you know are you primarily aiming at the media um, or are you actually aiming at the public? And can you find ways to do both? Because sometimes you need a different prop for getting the attention of the media, either static or, 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 or TV. Um, obviously not the radio, <laughs> but um, yeah, there might be different things that you need to consider depending on who you think your audience is. So for, um, for a photo shoot, I've, I've, I've put up this picture of a jet that I built for uh, Amnesty. Uh, this was... Uh, I'm tempted to call it a giant prop, but it's not actually giant in that a jet would be a good deal bigger than the prop I built. Um, but it was about a, a six foot long model of, uh, of the jet that was being sold to um, Saudi. And you can see uh, underneath it, we've got these three missiles falling from the jet as if they're being fired. And that's where we put the, uh, the messaging uh, made in the UK, uh, ruining lives in Yemen. So that you know the message is actually integrated into the prop and, and written on the missiles, um, and we put this on a trailer and drove it around the Houses of Parliament quite um, quite successfully. It's a bit nerve wracking because uh, it's mounted on this enormous scaffolding pole, um, but that was one way of just just sheer visual impact uh, uh, and plus movement. So, you know, the prop itself was was pretty realistic looking considering it's only made of foam. It had a very elaborate paint job on the surface of it that that rendered it um, looking a lot more detailed than it actually was. Uh, so we, we treated it as a kind of a blank canvas and then painted on top of that. So that's an example where I think you're just going for sheer visual impact, but there's a bit of motion in it. Um, you know, the novelty was driving it as if it was flying. So that was a really good example of one that was actually um, aimed, at the, um, aimed at the media itself. Um, so it was just a photo shoot, but obviously the public were, were, were pretty interested as well. We didn't have any flyering or leafleting going on around it because that wouldn't have been practical. So, you know, it could have worked. It could have worked as a, as a stunt aimed at the public. Um, so, yeah, um, what you're looking for is something that's going to photograph or, or film well. I think that was one of the, the, the main concerns about the jet, making sure that it was up in the air. So we put it on a 12-foot aluminium scaffolding pole mounted to the um, back of, uh, of the trailer that we were driving around. Um, and you're always looking, you're always looking for images that I think that regardless of what you're campaigning about, regardless of what the message that they're expressing is, they're just interesting in their own right. Uh, you know, this is, this is all about grabbing people's attention. It's the same as on the internet where you're tweeting or, or putting a, an image on, on, um, Facebook, you just primarily want to grab people's attention. And that's always worth thinking about first. You can, you can come up with a prop that beautifully and articulately um, expresses your message, but might not be very interesting. So I think that's the first mindset that you need to get into about grabbing people's attention. Um, and also, 
you know, looking at this jet, the way in which the message was integrated into the prop itself with the lettering on the missiles, um, although we had a banner underneath it reading uh, uh, UK stop arming Saudi Arabia, one of our concerns was that can a photograph, if it's the media are aiming for, can a photograph be cropped in such a way that it'll exclude your message? So it's always worth thinking where your message is. Can you integrate it into the prop so that if somebody saw the prop on its own without any other information, would it still express what it is you want to um, communicate to the public, either directly or, or through the media, through, um, through a visual medium? Um, if it's a street stunt, and uh, the next prop is, is relevant to that, then it's, it's different. It starts becoming about theatre rather than about something being photographed or filmed. It, it becomes about interacting with your environment and interacting with the public. And one of the most successful things I've done for that is these alien figures you can see. There are, there are these fully three-dimensional masks that are worn on people's heads. And the people are wearing these sort of kind of Star Trek standard alien robes. Uh, for some reason, aliens always wear robes. Um, and obviously people can see out through the, the mesh eyes. These were really, really striking. Whenever we took them out on the street, regardless of what we were doing, people just wanted to look at them. People were pointing at them, wanted to interact with them. So this is a really good example of where you've got a, a street theater style stunt. And again, like I said earlier, it's an image, it's a performance that works in its own right. Now we used the aliens, we built them primarily for a campaign about consumerism. We were looking at uh, the way in which the environmental impact of, of shopping and the environmental impact of excessive consumerism. So we took these, uh, we had actors inside them, amateur actors, and took them to various kind of uh, Arndale type centers and messed about, but we had people flyering um, behind them. So, you know, that's a very direct form of interaction where those people who've kind of like are looking in your direction, are interested in what you're doing, they all get a flyer. So it's the flyer that communicates the message, whereas the, the aliens just kind of make that initial visual impact. But we did have a tour guide with them, where, not in this photograph, but we had a tour guide with them wearing a silver spacesuit. And you know, uh, you see in London with the tour guides um, taking groups of um, groups of uh, tourists around the the landmarks. They've always got a little sort of flag on a pole. So we had our um, our astronaut tour guide was uh, rigged up with a mic, and he was able to make jokes about the different forms of advertising and inviting people to explain to the aliens what a rubbish bin is and and why why human beings throw things away. So this is a classic example. It's, it's a relatively simple thing to do. You know, you can make something like this out of paper mache and uh, try and get hold of some, um, some, some clothing from secondhand shops and so on and so forth. This one's very, very active and very dynamic and interactive, um, and, but quite difficult to do. You know, you've got to get people who are confident um, at acting and being a bit cheeky with the security guards in shops and all this sort of thing. Uh, but yeah, that, I thought that was a, a, a classic example where you know, we people borrowed these for lots of different actions. Um, uh, uh, in fact, I've lost track of all of them now. I've only got one uh, left that's now in a museum. Um, but yeah, uh, you, you could use this for a, a variety of different campaigns where, you know, the aliens are puzzled and they're asking questions about what's going on within society. So that's an extremely flexible one where if you weren't campaigning and you were just having fun doing a piece of street theatre, it would still work. And, and I think Factor X is partly about that. It's partly about entertaining people and getting people on your side because what you're doing is innately interesting and innately good humoured. Um, might not be suitable for every campaign, um, but it's just, it's, you know, there are, there are different approaches when you're thinking, what shall I build? What shall I build? You have to think about who you're trying to interact with and you have to think about getting them on your side and, uh, and, 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 and to some extent, either, either shocking or entertaining people is often a way to get them to listen, you know, if you're doing direct street theatre. Paul, I've got a question then. So does anything spring to mind that to using aliens in, 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 the, in our campaigns? 
I mean, you could you could certainly have a, a, an alien who's come to Earth and and has you know uh, had an accident and is now using a wheelchair. That might be quite amusing. Um, I mean, you'd have to be careful because of all the Davros imagery from Doctor Who, I think. Um, but yeah, I mean, it could be kind of I'm now stuck on this planet and, and nobody seems to want to help me um, uh, to, to sort of get out get back home. Um, there, there may be different things you could do around that. Might be some interesting messaging there. Um, it might be a little bit of a stretch to, to from that to, to talk about the specific sort of taxation or, or, or benefits policies that you're discussing but it, it's a possible approach it's definitely a possible approach I mean yeah I, I, I agree with you about whatever campaign is you have to make however complex social care and charging is the messaging we have to come up with has to be very straightforward and clear one of the things in campaigning that I often explain to people if you if they go away from thinking this is such a complex issue no wonder it's never sorted out so yeah yeah um um that's an important part that i mean that to me is partly the relationship between the cartoons i do and and the street props i do you know like it's about distilling a message down to a, a relatively simple image that's very clear to understand and evokes some kind of emotional response because, I mean, at the end of the day, you know, if you're talking about justice, that's an emotional response. And so you're trying to get people to feel a certain way as well as think a certain way. And you try to, to some extent, get them into a receptive frame of mind where they'll listen to the slightly more complex argument that you might have uh, if you're being interviewed or if you're handing out a flyer. So it's, it's, it's partly about priming people to listen, I think, is one of the, one of the functions of street theatre props that people sometimes forget. Um, and I was going to sort of jump on to um, the issue next of, of, about humour. So um, the gigantic puppet that you're looking at here, um, it's about 12 foot tall. It's a, a kind of, a, it's like a sort of metallic monster wearing a suit. And uh, the monster is made of, of sort of gas piping and uh, what's called a fracking wellhead. So this was an environmental protest about um, about the, uh, the use of fracking and, and trying to sort of get extra extra um, carbon carbon fuels from, uh, from from fairly sort of dodgy sources that a lot of people were were protesting about. There was a great deal of seriousness and anger around fracking as a political an environmental movement. And we thought it was quite important to inject a bit of humor into this. So you're looking at a puppet that's supported by three cables, or, or sorry, three poles, um, extremely lightweight, it's made of foam and, uh, and, and uh, uh, aluminium poling. Uh, it's a puppet that can be controlled. Uh, there's one person actually carrying the, the main bulk of the puppet using a, 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 flag, um, a flag mount that you, you sometimes see for heavy, um, heavy trade union banners. And then very much like the Muppets, there's, there's two operators at the sides who've got uh, long vertical poles that controlled the arms of the puppet, which were made of, um, of gas piping. Uh, and the whole thing looks quite sort of dirty and grim, but it's also got a very manic face. It's a kind of cartoon face that it's got. Now this uh, worked really well. A, it moved, you know, it was an animated puppet. Um, people love that. It was big, which raised issues about weight that I'll talk about in a bit when we go on to talk about construction. But it looks funny, and 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 you could, you know we could give this thing a character. We could rig up a um, one of those portable sound systems and 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 a, a we um, a we microphone so that the main operator who was moving the puppet um, could give it a voice and give it some character. Uh, now that's a really really great way to go forward because. People want to look at the puppet in its own right. It's just very striking, much like, you know, any of the sort of arty street theatre, the giant puppets that you sometimes see in the city. Um, people just want to look at it in its own right. It's an interesting object in its own right. But then it has a personality that can express. Um, we, we did it with a lot of irony because, you know, Mr. Frackhead, uh, the name of our puppet, was obviously in favour of fracking. So we gave him a script where he was making an idiot of himself and, uh, and, and was you know, making it quite clear that he didn't really care about the environmental um, 
consequences of what he was doing. So you can actually add character to your prop. You know, it doesn't necessarily have to be a static object. You can make a personality um, and, and movement when you're dealing with a puppet like this is, is really, really important. But we'll, I'll, I'll, we'll come back to that in a, in a little bit, actually, because I was, I was, yeah, I've got a specific point to make about um, what prop you may or may not build uh, motion into it. Thanks, Paul. I'll, I'll just go through some of the comments. Giselle is like, I want to dress these. Um, yeah, I, I, I'm up for doing that. I've done a bit of cheeky stuff over the years. Okay. Um, I think Liana, who introduced me, I think she's been involved in a lot of the Trojan horse they did outside, they wheeled into the British Museum. And then some environmentalist friends, they were involved in taking that, what are they called, from the wind turbines. Oh, the giant blade. Yeah, I know that crew. I know that crew. <laughs> okay. So one of my friends, yeah, she's um, she, she's in the video on that. So yeah, so there are, I'm just admitting someone again. So yeah, I'm sure there's a few of us who'd be willing to dress up in costumes. I actually prefer it. It's easier. If your face is covered, in some ways, it's then easier to act the clown. That's, that's the great thing about, yeah. uh, if, you, if your puppet's amusing right it might be a really really serious issue that you're dealing with but if your puppet is amusing it create or your, or your prop you know it doesn't have to be a puppet um uh, and also sorry one of the things i should have said is just sheer height on this the fact that it was it was 12 foot and mounted up on a big pole you know is is really to your advantage as well that's visually very striking but it once you've got that humor going it, you know it allows for some quite cheeky confrontations with those who you're protesting against if you've got a particular target you can start messing around and if you do that with good humor rather than you know the image of the angry protester screaming at a politician you can get a lot of people on your side a lot of people on your side if you're seen to have a sense of humor about a serious issue um, you make it enormously accessible to people um, because a lot of people are quite kind of scared of protesters aren't they and and, and or or, or or they become um protest fatigue i think sets in sometimes so humor is a, is a massive way around that and, and, a, and obviously a puppet is one approach but you know you can build humor into any kind of prop you build as well as making it visually um visually striking so yes yeah, some more comments are that going back to the alien theme that the suggestions that disabled people are perceived or treated as alien yeah, that's a good. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Being, and it's especially true as Mary Ellen has mentioned. Um, um, if you think about it in terms of our immigration system, that's a well-known trope about aliens coming in, taking our benefits, welfare, jobs, using the NHS. Uh, another comment is, what about skeletons or clown jokers? That's something that I'm sure we can think about later and yeah. alien to question why some people are seen as worthless and others as worthwhile and another such thing is ghosts also come to mind yeah i mean you, you can always do an action around halloween you know i mean you can actually gear what you do to a, a specific um cultural moment you know uh, and and that can be another really sort of interesting book i mean the last thing i was going to say as well is is like you know Humor doesn't have to soften the message um, because, you know, there's a lot of, of, of kind of sharp, angry humor that can be used around protest and around justice themes that I think people, again, respond really well to. Uh, a, a comedian speaking well about a political issue and doing it in a really funny way can have a lot more influence than a campaigner or a politician. I think that's really, really worth bearing in mind. Humor, 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 you know. Um, I think the other thing about humor and, and, and props that, that reflect that is, is people will tend not to listen to a political message if it reinforces in their minds that the world is a very negative, dark place. You know, if, if it's always about anger and it's always about suffering and stuff, people quite often have their own problems in their own lives and won't necessarily listen if, if you're projecting that image through how you protest. And that's another reason why I think humor and humorous props are, are, are a massive benefit 
if you want to get other people on side. And that applies, I think, to the street theatre and to stuff that ends up in the media. People like funny people. People like witty people. Uh, and I think that's worth, worth bearing in mind. To, you know, if you mix your, your anger, your legitimate anger about an issue with some humour, you're going a long way to getting, uh, getting people to listen. Oh, and the Queen is in this, um, in this puppet image as well. Um, the, the Queen, uh, uh, somebody wearing a mask of, uh, of Her Majesty, interacted with the puppet as well, that I thought was a, a very nice touch. Um, I guess it's also worth bearing in mind in terms of, of messaging, if you can also get people focused on the fact that there is a solution. You're asking for a specific solution, and if your prop can reflect that, people feel that they can do something then rather than, again, just coming away with a sort of sense of how horrible the world is and how horrible people are and you know, so on and so forth. So I think humour is a, a, a massively uh, important one. Um, so we're going to go, we're going to stay fairly sci-fi now with this next image. Um, these were um, the burger Daleks that I made for a, a, an animal rights campaign. Uh, so what you're looking at is uh, we're at the Houses of Parliament. We're on Westminster Bridge. Um, which is a classic thing that the original Doctor Who Daleks did. They, uh, they trundled down, um, down Westminster. But these Daleks are actually made of, uh, of fast food iconography. So the head of the Dalek, the sort of swiveling dome that the Daleks have on the top, is a, is a hamburger um, with Coke can lights instead of, a, instead of the Doctor Who ones. There's an upside down styrofoam uh, fast food cup with uh, a fictional corporate McDonald's type logo on it. And then the, the Dalek appendages is one is, a, one is a, a sort of a bull's eye, a literal bull's eye stuck on the end of a pole uh, and a chip and uh, uh, one of those fast food spatulas. So those are the kind of arms of the, of the Daleks. So it's a, uh, I'm showing this one in particular because uh, there's three of them, by the way, um, which will become relevant uh, a bit later on. Um, this is where you can use an existing cultural icon and twist it for your message. So the message here was very much a, a, a satire of McDonald's coming from a, an animal rights uh, perspective. These again were mobile. Um, they had wheels at the bottom and, and operators on the inside. The heads could turn. Um, again, people just loved them. I mean, people really liked them. Uh, when we did a photo shoot without any uh, permission from the authorities, the cops who turned up quite quickly because we were photographing them outside a police station, they immediately were being quite good humoured with us because one of them was a Doctor Who fan. Uh, so again, if you can make people laugh, that can often diffuse conflict. But here I'm sort of saying, you know, instead of, instead of having to invent something from scratch, you can riff on an existing cultural icon that people are familiar with and, and, and kind of you know, attach your message to that. Yeah, you can satirize it slightly, you can twist it slightly. Um, and the same is, is, is true with, with things like uh, uh, game iconography. So things like Monopoly or, or Snakes and Ladders or Punch and Judy can work really well. Um, for Christian Aid, we did a Punch and Judy show about fair trade and that got a huge crowd. We were down in Brighton at the time of one of the um, party conferences down there. And yeah, that was that was almost perfect. That one, it was a, a fantastic idea to do Punch and Judy. Um, people automatically love it. It's a it's a wee show that you can watch. It, it's easy to integrate messages into it. Um, but what we've also done snakes and ladders uh, for a, a, a fair trade campaign. Uh, so we built a, a kind of a vertical snakes and ladders. Uh, in which the head of the snake was a, a puppet controlled by someone's arm. And it was an unfair game of snakes and ladders where you would throw the dice, you'd move your counter, but the snake would move its head. So it was, it was all about cheating and being unfair. So you take your basic cultural icon and give it a twist. And, and if you give it a bit of animation, it was kind of like a Muppet type um, puppet for, uh, uh, for the snake that could open its mouth and you can get a lot of articulation into a puppet like that. It can nod, it can shake its head, it can hiss, it can open its mouth as if it's laughing. Um, there are all kinds of cultural icons, chess games, games of, uh, of, uh, of, of drafts and so on and so forth. Monopoly, fantastic one if you're talking about economics. So yeah, don't, don't rule out taking an existing cultural icon and, and, and giving it a bit of a twist to get your message across. 
Um, so uh, what I was going to do now is having having sort of talked about, if you like, the sort of theming of your prop, um, there are a few simple tricks I want to go through that will add a lot of impact for very, very little effort. So uh, unless there's any more questions or comments that people want to throw at this stage. Yeah, people love the punch and Judy idea. Good, 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 good. And, yeah. uh, um, someone said my son voted for the burgers. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, take yeah I'm old enough. I'm old enough to remember that being behind the sofa on those early days of the Doctor Who. Who, who I still get teased about that by my brothers and sisters. It's quite funny when you look back at those um, early episodes compared yeah. to what um, studios do today. And from what I understand, Doctor Who studio production has relatively small budgets. I mean, that's the other thing. These these things these things looked homemade. You know, uh, I think that's another thing that that's important. You uh, you don't have to have this kind of corporate slick high standard special effects um, finish to your props as long as they've got some humor they've got some humor to them I think is, is really important and one thing I should have mentioned with these sort of burger Daleks is we rigged them with voices so again you know like your prop could actually articulate your message directly either to the public or um, or on the tv so you know often you can build the messaging into your into your prop if, if it's got a voice if it's actually speaking to people so again that's that's you know these are just general principles that are worth sort of having in your head when you're thinking about what will or won't work if you're trying to pin down um, pin down factor x so yeah i was gonna now talk about like sort of um if you like the sort of cost effective way of doing props um and this next slide i'm bringing up is probably one of my oldest um uh, photos it's, um, we're basically in um, Trafalgar Square. Uh, we've got two big uh, red plastic banners saying the world is watching AIDS treatment for all by 2010, which tells you how old this, um, how old this prop was. But it's basically uh, hundreds of eyeballs sort of staring in the direction of parliament. Uh, and these eyeballs are all flat, two dimensional but they vary massively in size. Um, I, I built about six really quite big ones. The largest eyeball is uh, about six to seven foot uh, in size. It was painted on a cloth and supported by a, a plastic water pipe on the inside to keep the circular shape. Um, the biggest one, as I say, was about seven foot, but then I made two or three more uh, about, um, three or four foot and then I made one or one or two that were just two foot and they were just uh, they were just printed onto cardboard uh, all of them are mounted on poles and held by the protesters but you basically end up with a field of eyeballs of different sizes and the smaller ones are really really easy and cheap to make you know it's just a photocopier some glue and some cardboard sheeting and a pole but it makes the thing look much more elaborate than the amount of effort that actually went into it. And the people joining your protest um, like can actually bring their own homemade ones. I quite often do little Blue Peter guides, you know, which I'll send out to the campaign group saying, here's a basic, simple way to make your own eyeball. And then hundreds of them turn up. Uh, and although the large ones are what give you the kind of visual impact, the fact that there's loads and loads and loads of smaller, cheaper ones spreads the image out over a large area. So you don't necessarily have to think one big object. And repetition is incredibly powerful when you're doing street props. Uh, seeing the same object again and again, preferably of different sizes, so that the one main one will always show up well in a photograph or on the TV. Um, but smaller ones accompanying it it looks like you've put an enormous amount of effort into it, uh, but you spread that effort out over loads of people and the smaller objects don't necessarily require the kind of skills that, that somebody like myself would have to put together. Anybody can make one of the smaller items. So it could be anything, you know, uh, every time you think, oh, maybe the image we want is a key or maybe the image we want is a padlock or a wheel or something like that. You can always make lots of them rather than focusing all your energy 
on on a really really huge one so it's it's a bit like a canvas you're spreading yourself out thin but it looks really impressive so yeah repetition is an absolute um brilliant trick to to use um so the final thing in terms of sort of um construction that i was going to look at is uh, is just about keeping keeping your props simple yeah so i've got two slides here um linked to each other um uh, so one we're looking at a very detailed complex uh, bulldozer so the full monty you know the detailing on the uh, on the tracks uh, nuts on the wheels the little ladder that takes you up to the cabin um, the the windscreen wipers the, the 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 different pistons on it and all the different joints that's one way you could put a bulldozer together if a bulldozer is appropriate to um the campaign that you're doing if you if, you, if you're sort of saying don't bulldoze this this uh, this housing estate or something like that you could make something really elaborate um you know with vents and grills uh, and often people fall into that trap of thinking that's the only way you can express bulldozer but in the, oh dear i've gone and lost the um the slides just give me a, a second i don't know what happened there so i'll just bring up the yeah i don't know why that jumped well yeah okay so there we go so here what we're looking at is a much much simpler cartoon image that i threw together in a couple of seconds i've done it extremely crudely to get across the fact that elaborateness isn't always the way that you express um what your prop is this is basically just a, a cardboard box a vertical cardboard box uh, it's it's sloping slightly at the top to make a windscreen and there's windows at the sides there's a person inside it who's got a kind of like almost like a toy steering wheel and apart from that apart from apart from just the box there's a blade at the front which is just a piece of cardboard sheeting and then at the sides, there's just these um, sort of pretend uh, uh, tractor wheels, um, you know, like the, the, the caterpillar tracks. But again, that's just a very simple two-dimensional shape. But onto that, you can then paint quite a bit of detail. You can paint on your, um, your, your headlights of the, of the tractor. You can paint on a grill, an exhaust grill. Um, you can paint on the wheels. You know, you really don't have to build something um, elaborate. And although it's an extremely silly um, bulldozer that you're looking at, um, people, again, like that kind of amateur humor. So rather than spending weeks and weeks and weeks building this, this realistic movie special effects uh, bulldozer, why not make a really simple one like this out of a six foot tall box with somebody inside it? And of course, if it's somebody who's, who's got a motorized wheelchair, you're absolutely laughing. You're absolutely laughing in terms of the movement. Um, it's ideal um, if you can get, I mean, you, you could spend ages making a motor for something, but if somebody's already got one with them, um, great. You know, like uh, you, it's to your advantage. Um, the, the person inside the bulldozer is wearing a yellow hat as well. And this incredibly simple cardboard box um, uh, it doesn't even have, you know, you don't even have to have glass in the windows. Uh, they can just be holes. Um, it's all painted that sort of bright bulldozer yellow. So, so sometimes colour can express an enormous amount of information that, um, that, that otherwise uh, is missing. So, yeah, and, and, and on the side of the, um, of the bulldozer where the door would be, I've just put your message here because you can actually put lettering on your prop. You don't have to have a separate banner that might get cropped out in a photograph. You can actually put your message either on the blade or on the side of, uh, of the bulldozer. Now, I'm not, obviously, I'm not suggesting bulldozing might be appropriate to what you want to express, but it does get across the principle that, that, that getting all elaborate and, you know, starting to think, oh, this thing has to look realistic, otherwise people will think it's rubbish and cheap. They won't. If it looks rubbish and cheap and it's quite clearly a cardboard box that you painted yellow, that's funny uh, and people people like the plucky underdog campaigner you know you don't have to aim for this sort of theater or special effects movie type prop you can use a lot of simplicity to get your message across and you can then build three of them in the time it would take to make something more elaborate you can have three um, objects um, for the same amount of effort and as i said earlier repetition is is brilliant having three props following each other around and you can start mucking about 
that it's much easier to move. It doesn't matter if it wobbles while it moves. That's that's humorous as well. So again, that, that you don't get lost in the detail. Keep it simple. Keep it simple. I think there was a question. Was that? Um, yeah, Mary Ann's got her hand up. You're muted. Mary Ellen, sorry, Mary Ellen. Uh, you're yeah. Yeah. Hi. Um. Thank you. These are really amazing. That is, and uh, I don't know if you've seen. I'd created an art installation called Invisible, which is just a wheelchair with wheel clamps, uh, just made out of cardboard on the sides, saying uh, immobilized by the the cuts and by the DWP, etc. And on uh, and the invisible person in the chair with the nappy, with the nappy, uh, with the message in the nappy, like a message in the bottle the message in the nappy saying um, how disabled people are being who aren't incontinent uh, are being left for 12 hours at a time in incontinence pads rather than give them the care and uh, as we're talking about scrap care charging this installation was created in a way that with the idea of it being replicated because anyone can use an old wheelchair put some props on it to it to um, convey the idea of the invisible person and a pair of shoes on the back for the invisible care, carer because of the carer's jobs that are being lost um, and the, the with the break with Brexit the, the lack of carers availability etc and so it's it's a very simple uh, thing I can I can post a link in the chat to the, the files for it but it, the idea is to replicate that and use it across wherever anyone is to be able to show how disabled people are becoming invisible through either we're dying or we're being locked up in care homes or we're becoming virtual prisoners in our own homes through the lack of care and the cuts. So, and, and so it's, it's a, an, a invisible as well as um, in, re, in relation to the uh, the UN's report about uh, the, the grave and systemic human rights violations of disabled people. Um, so it, it was showing just how much is invisible about making that invisible visible. Yeah, I mean, that's classic. That's exactly what I'm talking about. I mean, you know, uh, A, it's humorous, although it's got, a, it's got a kind of dark humor to it, hasn't it? But, you know, it's humorous. It's yeah. something that people are already annoyed about just being just being clamped is is a cultural icon isn't it yeah so you're taking advantage of that as well and it's, and it's really simple and replicable i think i think that's brilliant that's exactly what i'm talking about i've, I've actually got a real wheel clamp that uh, pilfered from somewhere <laughs> as on one 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 side and then cardboard one on the other side and you can <laughs> but, you can put but, 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 clamp, but you can just make up yeah, you can you can get plastic chain that looks like real chain. I've, I've got and, them just over on the uh, shelf here. <laughs> so, so just to look, I just say that we can we can have best of equipment, because, and and that's the thing they keep saying. Oh, we'll we'll give you we'll we'll look at we'll send an OT. We'll give you some some rail. Give you this. We'll give you that. But all that equipment means nothing if we can't actually have the care to use it. I mean, if, if you don't have the means to be you, able to go out and about, what you, if if you were going to do a sort of a humorous blockade or semi blockade, then then there's another layer there, isn't there? You know, we're not going to move. There's a sort of, well, we can't. You know, so there's a double a double edge to that as an image. I think that's yeah. that's exactly what I'm getting at. Yeah. So so uh, if anyone's interested, uh, all the all the the messages, everything is are, are on printable P PDF um, images, JPEG images. So, uh, if anyone's interested in replicating that and using it wherever they are, uh, I'm happy to, to send send that information. I could just send it via the email that came out about this Zoom meeting. I could attach it and reply to that. I was going to say the other so, thing is it's. it's, it's um, it's very easy to recognize because it's a yellow triangle. Um, so objects that are very familiar to people um, don't necessarily need elaborate prop building because, you know, like a, a, a mug, a mug of tea is instantly recognizable, even if it's not built in a very sort of elaborate way. 
So it's, it's worth thinking about how simple the, um, the object you're building is and how immediately recognizable it is, is another, um, another factor that I should have mentioned earlier. Um, uh, thank you. I'll just by uh, Mary Ellen, I, ha I had to mute you because I think it was creating some feedback and echo. Um, we can spend another five or six minutes if people want to turn on their cameras and um, chat with Paul and then we'll take a 10 minute break. I'm someone who can last about 40, 50 minutes in front of a Zoom screen when there's lots of people on it and then I need a break. I get the, what's the word, the sensory overload. Go on, Paul. Well, just uh, there's, there's a wee bit more I was going to Okay, oh, sorry. sorry. Um, I can do that a bit faster if you want. And uh, No, that's fine. Okay, so I mean that that was that was concepts, that was ideas. Uh, as I say, repetition, color, simplicity, humor, blah 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 blah. Um, the last one I was going to just mention is is, is magnification. Um, uh, sometimes, if you take a small object and make a big version of it, that has some innate humor and uh, impact in its own right. So sometimes, like just a giant match or a giant cotton wool bud, if you want to say to somebody that they need to listen uh, and so on and so forth, making a, a large land of the giants, uh, borrowers uh, type big object and playing with scale is another way to get a lot of impact with very little effort. A huge box of matches is pretty easy to build. Um, so there are, you know, sometimes just making large objects, a bit like the repetition uh, and maybe combining them, you know, several Supersized objects. Um, it, it's just a nice, a nice simple trick to to to, to get some impact. Um, height is another really uh, important one. I talked about the the the, the puppet, um, uh, the frack head puppet that we made. Um, a lot of its height was simply the pole that it was mounted on. Um, so instead of it having legs um, uh, uh, from the sort of bottom of its jacket down to the ground, was just a pole. And getting something up in the air makes it look bigger. Than it actually is, and and you know people can see it over their heads. So if you're in a busy shopping area or something, it, it increases your visibility, it increases your impact. So that's just a nice, you know, stick your prop on a pole and get it up in the air is a is a good way to get um to get attention. Particularly if there's a background that you want it photographed against, say the Houses of Parliament or something like that. Whereas something that you hold on the floor isn't necessarily going to uh, have as much impact. Apart from if you're dealing with pedestrians, then something sometimes a big monopoly game on the floor uh, can have as much impact as something raised up in the air. Um, I was just going to very quickly look at, at construction. I'm not going to go into a huge amount of detail because I've already said, you know, find ways to make it simple. So A, it's easy and quick to build. Uh, it's cheaper to build. But um, when you're building, weight becomes a massive issue, um, uh, particularly if it's a large puppet or something like that. So it's always worth bearing in what, you know, what your construction materials are. So if, for instance, you wanted to make a giant key that symbolized being able to get out of the house, uh, you could get yourself an enormous sheet of plywood, uh, an eight by four sheet of plywood and a, a jigsaw, but you then made a prop that's really, really heavy to support and to transport uh, and can't necessarily go on tour because it becomes really expensive to courier. Um, so it's worth thinking about foam sheeting, it, you know, find ways to get around uh, the weight issue. The eyeballs that I showed you earlier, um, the, the six foot ones, the cloth was extremely light and there was just a circle of, uh, of, of blue um, water piping, uh, which will keep its shape at quite a large size. Uh, but that was holding the prop together, so it didn't weigh much. It made a fantastic frisbee as well. <laughs> Oddly enough, <laughs> we, we were in Edinburgh uh, for the for the G8 summit, and we were frisbeeing these things around a field, um, which was quite funny. Now, it wasn't their original use, but um, I, I threw one to somebody, and I suddenly realised it was a fantastic frisbee. Um, and say uh, somebody mentioned a giant chain or chains earlier, uh, like if you wanted to make a giant chain, say a ball and chain, and you wanted the ball to be six foot rather than the standard football size that those prison, um, those Victorian prison balls and chains are, um, something inflatable is, is always worth, uh, you know, like it makes it easier to transport. But if you're making a giant chain, um, you can get gray um, insulation piping um, it's like a, 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 that, that stuff that, that wraps around um, copper piping and you can bend that into chain shapes. So you end up with something extremely lightweight. But yeah, there's a couple of props I've done where they were on the cusp of not being workable um, because they were so heavy. 
uh, and that's just worth bearing in mind. And believe it or not, I've made a prop that wouldn't go out of the door of the workshop. <laughs> it was early days, early days. Um, but yeah, we built it too big to get through the door. Um, <laughs> so we had to dismantle it to transport it. So it's always worth thinking if you if, say if you're building a giant jet, it's always worth thinking uh, are there ways that I can make the um, make the wings removable or you know can the can the prop split in half? Can it be deflated? Um, can it be packed away? Because transport costs, if you want, uh, you know, we, we talked earlier about some stuff is national and some is local. Um, you might want to tour your prop. Um, so you'll have to think about a combination of durability uh, and, and, and weight. So just, yeah, that's just a trap not to fall into um, making something extremely heavy um, uh, because you're aiming for robustness can mean that it becomes unusable uh, if it can't be transported and can't be supported easily. Um, and that's about it, really. I mean, those are the, the, the main sort of, if you like, the background of, 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 of ideas to have in mind when, when we're trying to decide what to build. Um, and yeah, I hope that's kind of primed people for, for thinking about what can or can't be done, uh, both in terms of imagery and uh, in terms of uh, impact and in terms of construction. So yeah, that's, that's kind of me done. I guess we can sort of